Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Social Studies. It has been a while. Well, for some of you, some of you it has not. Um, anyways, this is 5.4, George Washington and the brand new government, domestic issues and foreign relations. And I'm setting my stopwatch so I don't go too long. All right, so um, this is the sheet, sheet number one. And on the back of sheet number one, sheet, the front of the sheet number one should already be filled in, George Washington and the brand new government about setting precedents, etc. Now we are on the back, and we're not going to do the whole back. We're going to do domestic issues and foreign relations right here. Domestic issues, problems in the United States, and foreign relations dealing with other nations. So domestic and foreign. These are words you should hopefully know, but if you don't, here are some definitions for you. Domestic, like a domestic, a domesticated animal, domestic cats, domestic um, violence, things that happen within the home. That's one definition of it. And kind of, if you think of our country as a home, that's kind of the same thing. Things are occurring inside a particular country, not foreign or international. So things within our country, within the United States, that means is domestic. As opposed to foreign, which is basically dealing with other countries, like a foreign language. So foreign relations, dealing with other countries, domestic issues, problems at home or inside the United States of America. Okay, we're going to do domestic issues first. And one of the big domestic issues of the day back during, sorry about that, um, during Washington's presidency, one of the big domestic issues is going to be debt. Debt, debt, debt. And hopefully you remember what debt means. It means owing money. When you owe money, that is debt, owing money. Okay, and there's a semicolon there. After that, Alexander Hamilton is going to come up with a plan. He is the Secretary of Treasury. This is him on the $10 bill, the $10 founding father. Um, he is going to come up with a plan to pay back the debts. That's money owed by both the state and the federal governments. Okay, um, so there it is, debts. The problem was that the states and federal governments both owed money that they had been borrowed during the Revolutionary War. So his plan, he comes up with the plan to repay both state and federal debts. So you can write this part, um, the, the number one, to repay debts owed by both the state and federal. Oh, that actually should be governments, but it's or to repay both state and federal debts. The, the, the governments of the states and the federal government owe debts. And Hamilton says the federal government is going to step in and pay it all. They're going to pay for both the states and the federal government. Okay, the second part of the plan is going to be to improve economic growth. You don't have to write anything there because it's already written for you. Now, the problem is this is going to include some taxes to pay. The government's going to have to, if the federal government's going to pay for all these debts, they're going to need some money. And one way they're going to, the way governments get money is through taxation. So there's a whole bunch of different taxes put on. Um, this is what the country kind of looks like at the time. And we are going to focus on this part of Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania. This is the state of Pennsylvania. As you can see, it's the state right below New York. Okay, Pennsylvania, as you probably recall, was one of the middle colonies, aka the breadbasket colonies, where they grew corn and wheat and oats, and um, they were more tolerant. They were kind of a mixture of the New England colonies and the southern colonies. Okay, so what does this have to do with anything? Well, way out here in the western part of the state, kind of like so a little southwest of where we are, what is now near Pennsylvania, just on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, some farmers were getting a little upset. They were upset because part of Alexander Hamilton's plan to pay back these debts was to put a tax on whiskey. Whiskey is an alcoholic beverage. 
And the thing is, farmers out here on the western part of western side of the Appalachian Mountains, it was good, so good fertile soil. They could grow corn and wheat and things like that. The problem is the roads did not exist yet. There were no roads. So transporting those things was very, very difficult to transport your corn and wheat and oats to market. So the farmers discovered, hey, you know, if we, we can shrink this down to make it easier to ship by turning it into whiskey, whiskey alcohol, which we can put in barrels, which we can then ship much easier. So they start to make some money on by producing whiskey. Now, Alexander Hamilton, with this plan, is going to put a tax on whiskey. And the farmers out here don't like paying taxes. Hmm. So they do what, we kind of have a repeat of what's happened before. These farmers, they grab their muskets and their pitchforks and they start a militia and they start a little rebellion. They start to take over courthouses, county buildings, things like that. They start to kind of overthrow the government. Hmm, does this sound familiar? Farmers upset about taxes, forming militias. Where have we heard of this before? Oh, wait, Shays Rebellion up in Western Massachusetts. And also before the Revolutionary War up in Massachusetts. So we have this pattern of people not wanting to pay taxes and grabbing their weapons and forming militias and trying to take power into their own hands. Now, this is called the Whiskey Rebellion, not Shays Rebellion, the Whiskey Rebellion. You can see they tarred and feathered a tax collector just like they had in previous rebellions. But this is an unsuccessful revolt by farmers who were angry about the tax on whiskey. Now, you might remember with Shays Rebellion, what happened was that the, the, the Massachusetts government asked for help. The national government said, sorry, we're too weak. All right, things are different now. We have a new constitution. Now the national government is stronger and George Washington is the president. And George Washington himself leads a big show of force. They get some soldiers together. They don't really have an army yet, but they get the militia together and they march out there to Western Pennsylvania where they ride on horseback. Um, they go and they arrest these people. They put down the rebellion. So the rebellion is unsuccessful. And Washington basically shows them, we're not going to mess around with you rebels. We are a stronger national government now, and we're going to use that power to enforce our laws. You have to respect our laws of the federal government because we will enforce them. So this is this is a nice cartoon of George Washington. This is supposed to be bottling up the whiskey rebellion. And you can see this is a bottle of whiskey. It says no whiskey tax, Pennsylvania whiskey, the constitution under his arm. So he, with this new constitution, he is able to bottle up and stop the whiskey rebellion. It's kind of the opposite of Shays rebellion. So to fill in your notes here, what happened if you haven't already, the whiskey rebellion, it's called, what was it? It was a revolt against taxes by farmers in PA. That's already written for you, but make sure you know what it is. What happened? Washington, GW, Washington and the U.S. Army quickly ended the rebellion. Why was this important? Well, because it showed that the federal government, the FedGov, underlined was strong enough or circle it was now strong enough to enforce its laws. This is, of course, the opposite of Shays' Rebellion. The opposite of Shays' Rebellion. And you're filling in the pink sheet as we go along. You're going to have to show me that in class. So hopefully you could pause here if you need to and do that. How am I doing on time? Oh, uh, time is going. Time just flies when you're having fun. We're almost up to nine minutes already. I'm going to try to bring this in under 15 minutes, but we still have to do foreign relations. Foreign relations means dealing with other nations, dealing with other nations, foreign relations. Now, George Washington strongly believed that the U.S. should always try to stay neutral, 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 neutral. What does neutral mean? It means not choosing sides and staying out of war. This is very difficult, though, because a war breaks out between France and Britain and both sides are trying to get the United States to join them in the war. And we'll talk about this a little more in 
when you're in school about why what led to this war, etc. Um, but Washington's going to try to stay neutral. It's going to be difficult to do because of that war between France and England. And we'll talk about it more. This is also a time when, for the first time as a new country, we are signing treaties with other nations. So this is how you deal with other countries. Sometimes you sign treaties with them. Um, the French Revolution. Do I have time to go into the French Revolution? Um, we'll, we'll just we'll come back to this and talk about it in school. But just so you know, the French Revolution is what's going to kind of lead to that war with France and England. So we sign, as, as France and England are fighting a war and we're trying to stay neutral, we do sign a treaty called Jay's Treaty with Britain. And basically... This pre, this what this it's it's named after John Jay. He's the one who negotiated the treaty, and it basically strengthened the ties between the U.S. and Britain. It basically just said, Britain, we are not going to join you in the war. We are not going to join France in the war. We're just going to stay neutral, but we will keep trading with you, Britain. Now, we took that as a sign of we are staying neutral. France did not like that at all. They thought that was a sign that we were staying by by telling britain that we would stay out of the war we were really stabbing our friend france in the back and not helping them out so that's going to lead some stress another treaty we signed is one called pinckney's treaty pinckney's treaty is you don't really need to know this but it's good to have in the notes good to know that we signed the treaty this is a treaty with between the united states and spain it was allowed the United States to use the Mississippi River and the port, the city of New Orleans. If you look at the map here, um, the United States extended right to this edge of the Mississippi River, but the Mississippi River itself was owned by Spain. Spain was a foreign country, of course. Now we want to use the Mississippi River because all of these rivers, all of this land here, all these rivers flow into the Mississippi and there are no roads back then. So the only way to transport things is by river. So it's really important that we could use this river. So we signed this treaty called Pinckney's Treaty that allows us to use the river and to use the city of New Orleans down here where the Mississippi River hits the ocean. All right. So that brings us to relations with, with American Indians who we saw as foreign countries because they were generally. So there's going to be two important treaties with American Indians. The Treaty of Greenville, we don't really need to know much about this. I won't ask you about it unless you have your notes in front of you. It is the Treaty with Miami Indians, which gave the U.S. the land known as the Northwest Territory, um, which is this area. It will become important. We'll talk about it. But it's the area east of the Mississippi, north of the Ohio River. This is the Ohio River. So basically Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, this area around the Great Lakes, that's the Northwest Territory. And the this was controlled in large part by several different tribes, but one of the main tribes was a tribe called the Miami Indians, and they agreed to allow us to settle in this area. It, we'll talk about that more later as well. The other treaty was a treaty called the Canandaigua Treaty. This is a picture of the Canandaigua Treaty. This is on display somewhere in the hallways of Canandaigua Middle School. Not the original, just a copy of it. But I will give anyone who tells me accurately where it is located an imaginary solid gold star. Okay, so you'll be almost imaginary rich if you tell me where this is. Um, anyways, this was a treaty which is one of the first treaties signed by the United States. Um, it's signed by George Washington and it is on display. There are two copies of it. One of these copies is currently on display. This is a picture of it right here at the Smithsonian Institute, the, which is the museums in Washington, D.C., um, the Smithsonian American Indian Museum, and this is this is a picture of it uh, from their website. One of the earliest treaties signed by between a native a nation and the United States confirmed peace with the Haudenosaunee. The Haudenosaunee was the 
um, Seneca name for the Six Nations, otherwise known as the Iroquois. So this was a treaty between the United States and the Iroquois or the Haudenosaunee. Um, this is the display in Washington, D.C. about the Canandaigua Treaty. Um, and you can see it has a picture of our very own Canandaigua Lake. And, of course, the Peace Belt you might recognize, which our um, logo is based on. And then we have two, not one, but two monuments to the Canandaigua Treaty located down on Main Street in front of the courthouse on Main Street, the Canandaigua Treaty. And so that is, let me just get this in here, Canandaigua Treaty, so you can fill in your notes, a treaty, the U.S. Treaty with the Haudenosaunee. The Haudenosaunee is the name, again, for the Iroquois Confederacy or the League of Iroquois Nations. Basically, the the terms of the treaty, which is still in effect, basically says, look, we will not interfere with the, we being the United States, we will not interfere with the Haudenosaunee, and the Haudenosaunee will not interfere with us. Now, whether we've lived up to that treaty is debatable, at least, but that treaty is still enforced every year, November 11th, there is a treaty ceremony. They often start at the elementary school and have a parade up to the courthouse where they read the treaty again. Um, so this is something you should know because not only was it important because we've been talking about the Iroquois all year long and, and, and secondly is because it's one of the few things, probably the only thing we learn about that's called Canadagua. So you should be able to remember that one. Okay. And that's all we have for today. How did I do on time? Um, 16 minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. I will stop right now. Have a nice day.